and 3D printing next generation program. Super excited to invite you over to the first maker education during COVID-19 event, uh, which is created in collaboration with Acorn Labs. Um, Ashley, wanna take it from here? I'm actually gonna pass it off to Mary. I think she's gonna get us started here. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, thank you everyone for joining. We're super excited for this conversation um, and to get this panel started. Um, I'm Mary Hadley, I'm the CEO of Maker Girl and I have with me I'm Ashley Horn. I am the COO of Acorn Labs, and um, yeah, we're excited to be here today. Awesome. I'll go ahead and introduce our awesome panelists. We have Jamie Back, is a high school STEAM teacher and makerspace coordinator at Cincinnati Country Day School in Cincinnati, Ohio. In 2020, she was selected to be a Science Friday Educator Collaborator. She is a maker and a lifelong learner who enjoys bringing engineering design, making, computational thinking and 3D printing into her classroom. Thank you, Jamie, for being here today. We also have Samantha Corum, received her bachelor's degree in education and master's degree in teaching and curriculum from Michigan State University and has been an educator for 10 years. She is currently teaching science and a project lead the way design and modeling at Ferndale Middle School in Ferndale, Michigan. Samantha lives with her husband and ninth month old daughter and two cats. Thanks, Samantha, for being here. Jackie Durr is in her 22nd year of teaching sixth grade as a STEM teacher in Persbury, Ohio. She is the advisor of the High Impact Peer Program Leadership Group, Drone Racing Coach, and Basketball Coach. She has presented at a variety of national conferences on 3D printing and enjoy learning new things in the 3D printing industry. Thanks, Jackie, for being here. And then we, as final, we have Christine Mitko, who has spent over 20 years in K through 12 education, most recently as a teacher at Black Pine Circle School in Berkeley, California, where she has been a middle school teacher, STEAM coordinator, and Maker Club sponsor. While teaching, she has worked as a curriculum developer at the Lawrence Hall of Science, the Advanced Light Source, at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and most recently as a field employee assigned to the Center, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Mitko and her students are frequent presenter at EdTech conferences, science festivals, and maker fairs. Thank you all for joining. We're so excited to have this. Yeah, we are super excited to have all of you here. Um, I think we have just such an incredible group of educators on this panel, um, and we're really excited to hear about um, kind of what they've done in the realm of 3D printing and design uh, during COVID-19, because it has been very different. Um, but before we kind of jump into that, I wanna give each of our teachers um, the opportunity to kind of talk about what they were doing prior to COVID in terms of 3D design and printing in their classroom. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie first, if you wanna talk a little bit about your experiences prior to COVID so that we can get an understanding of what changed. Sure, uh, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this panel with these other amazing educators. Um, so I have two roles, um, a makerspace coordinator and a classroom teacher. And as a classroom teacher, I taught all my classes um, about additive manufacturing and tried to integrate at least one engineering design or math art 3D printing project um, each semester. Um, so I tried to do as much as I could. Uh, and as makerspace coordinator, my role was a little bit different, but it was more helping to bring other teachers, other classes into the makerspace um, for short-term or long-term making projects. So awesome. thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Samantha, do you wanna tell us a little bit about your experience prior to COVID? Sure, okay. So um, first of all, yeah, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak today. Um, this is really exciting. Um, so prior to COVID, um, one of the courses that I teach is called Project Lead the Way Design and Modeling. And in that course, I teach uh, students the basics of 3D design, and we have the ability to 3D print um, some pretty basic designs. Um, there's two projects that I really love. One of them is um, students are making a cube puzzle with seven pieces and they're just squares put together, but they print those. Um, and then we also print a um, therapeutic toy and students are able to use um, the 3D printer to help with, with that printing too. Um, 
in our building, I'm the only one with the 3D printer, but all of the staff has access to it. So if anybody wanted to use it, they would um, kind of, I would organize that for them. So that's that. <laughs> gotcha. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, Jackie, do you want to tell us about your experience with 3D printing and design prior to COVID? Sure. Thanks for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, it's an honor to be with the educators that I'm with today. Uh, so prior to COVID, um, I taught Tinkercad with 3D printing to seventh and eighth grade students. I used a variety of challenges. I call them challenges um, that I would present to the students. For example, um, I have a diversity lesson that revolves around designing an ornament. So like here's a Diwali candle that was designed by a student. Um, I've used the Ultimaker Design Challenge cards for group work and used the 3D printing during a battery powered car project. I'm also uh, the drone racing coach. And so we've used the 3D printer to print the parts for the drone. So when the kids smash them up, it's like, all right, we'll just print another one. <laughs> so. That sounds like fun. And sounds like your students get to uh, go back and forth with those designs a couple of times. <laughs> sounds like fun. Uh, Christine, do you wanna go ahead and tell us about your experience prior to COVID? Yes, so again, I'm excited to be here with all of you, so thank you. Um, I primarily am a life science teacher in seventh grade, and um, that's what I was doing when I got into 3D printing. One thing my students are very good at is encouraging me to spend my own money. And so when I brought this cool technology I'd seen at um, you know, the Maker Fair in 2009, I was like, there's this thing, it's like a self-replicating machine. The kids are like, we should buy one. And then in, so 2011, I got our, and you remember what they looked like back then. So um, I feel really strongly that my kids are involved in the whole process. They do our troubleshooting, our maintenance. A lot of times um, they help me order the parts and fix them. And so that thing spent more time in parts than it did actually functional. Since then, I do have a little bit of a 3D printer problem. I've probably had 15 different machines. Um, and it was primarily an after school program. So the kids are always in the room playing with the 3D printers that morphed into a um, after school maker club. And that turned into kind of our sandbox for what activities we would develop that we can bring into the curriculum, because it's great for kids to have after school access, but really I wanted all kids to have access. So then um, we brought and Tinkercad being browser based changed everything. So then we brought Tinkercad into our sixth grade tech program. So in addition to learning like Google apps and how to type, um, all the kids learned about 3D design. Um, probably the most interesting um, project we worked on was in 2014, I got hooked up with the Advanced Light Source, which is a particle accelerator that's in Berkeley. Our school is also in Berkeley. And my scientists invited us, the kids up to the lab um, because I had had a summer internship where they had just gotten their first 3D printer. And they're like, we don't really know what to do with it either. And so we came up with curriculum to visualize micro scale structures um, that were, um, you know, the imagery was taking at the light source. And so my students actually got to go to light source, bring a sample, collect the data, bring it back and 3D print. And now they're holding the model in their hand. So, you know, we have models of like butterfly wings and the surface of eggshells. And um, that project ultimately led us to the Bay Area Maker Fair and the White House Maker Fair in 2014, which was a really cool experience for our kids. So at the time it was, you know, no one knew 3D printing and our kids were on the cutting edge and we did all these science festivals. And then, you know, 3D printing people know about now and people have access to. So we're moving into our next stage of how do we use it as a tool in our classroom? So instead of being like a shiny new thing, it's just another thing in our classroom, like a ruler or a whiteboard. And so I'm pretty excited about it. And the kids still are in charge of all the maintenance. Wow, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I imagine that that maintenance piece has changed quite a bit this year, uh, given they aren't near the printers as often. But um, yeah, so I guess maybe that leads into our next question of, I wanna set the stage and kind of understand what your guys's remote learning experience has been like. Um, so Samantha, I'm gonna start with you. 
Can you describe what your uh, situation has been like? Have you been in person? Have you been remote the whole time? Um, and just kind of delve into that and then tell us where you're at now. Yeah, so my school district has been 100% virtual since the beginning of this school year. Um, we have an, a learning lab that students can go to, um, maybe like if students need a little more structure, a little bit more um, support in that school environment, but that's pretty limited on how many kids actually go to that. Um, and we just found out our board has decided to move us to a hybrid plan starting um, in March, we'll be doing kind of a rolling a rolling start. So my specific school will be starting um, this hybrid plan on March 8th. About a year later, I guess, right? Yeah, um, yeah pretty much. <laughs> all right, uh, Jamie, can you tell us where you've been? Have you been remote, uh, in person? Sure. Uh, so our school is um, uh, 18 years to 18 months. Um, I particularly work in the upper school or the high school, but the entire school has been hybrid since the start of August. Um, so most students are in person. Um, there is a portion of the school population who has chosen to learn remotely at home. So we have some in person and some students who are hybrid who join you know, the class with, uh, with Microsoft Teams. Um, so we've got students who transition to remote temporarily when they're quarantined, when they're sick. Um, and in, in terms of the, the school, the school can sort of satisfy the needs of each division on its own. In terms of the high school, we've only had, um, we've been fortunate. We had uh, one week of uh, full remote learning in the first semester and one, rem one week of full remote learning in the second semester. So otherwise we've been in person. Hybrid. Okay. Well, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So much different from Samantha's situation. Um, Jackie, what has your situation been like? So in our district, I'm in Ohio. Um, in our district, it really depends on what grade you are in. So district wide, we have Mondays as a remote day for everyone. Um, K through six started out Tuesday through Friday in the classroom. Um, grade seven and eight were hybrid and the high school is full remote. Then as time went on, uh, beginning in November seven and eight, which is what I teach, we went to Tuesday through Friday and that lasted for a whole five days. <laughs> um, on the last day that we were in the building, we had 203 students out, um, out of about 750, 800 kids, which that may or may not have been all COVID related, but still it's a lot of kids out. Um, then we were full remote from the week before Thanksgiving until mid-January, where we came back hybrid. And um, currently our district is remote, still remote on Mondays, K through four, Tuesday through Friday, all students are in class. And then uh, six through 12 is hybrid. Now they're going to be voting, I think next week, where we may be coming back to the junior high starting March 1st, all in Tuesday through Friday. So. Um, let's hope we get our vaccines soon. Wow, uh, that is quite the schedule change <laughs> from month to yeah. month. Uh, I'm impressed that you're even able to keep track of that. Um, Christine, what about you? What has your school situation been like? So like many of us, our school closed in May. And at that time, um, we lost access to our rooms and therefore the makerspace. Um, if you weren't an essential worker, you were not allowed on campus until late in the summer. So um, in we started in the fall remote. Our K-5 students went back in late fall. And then starting in 2021, our middle school has a hybrid program. Um, we are in California, so we have pretty good weather. So our kids learn outside, socially distanced, wearing masks under big tents. So we have no indoor classes right now. Um, also, they they're, we're keeping a pretty tight cohort system. So our kids aren't allowed to share materials. So, you know, we've all resigned ourselves that, you know, we're looking at fall 2021, maybe before we start doing any maker activities in person again. Yeah, wow. I mean, I, I think one thing that's just so interesting is to hear the difference in each of your guys' situation from Samantha, who's been remote the whole time, and then the schedule changes basically for everyone else. Um, so before we kind of jump into what you're doing now, I really want to kind of dig into what that transition period was like from 
being fully in the classroom 100% of the time to either going remote or, or kind of doing a hybrid system. Um, Christine, would you mind answering that first question of what was that transition period like for you and your students? Okay, so um, at the time we closed, it was my first year officially as STEAM coordinator, and we were implementing some cross-curricular activities like using the laser cutter in art class, and we are working, the kindergartners were using the Glowforge, and you know we were really rocking, and then we closed. Um, so like many science and math teachers, I was converted into tech support and teacher training, and so actually they didn't continue my tech classes for the rest of the spring. Um, trying to get our remote learning um, pivoted in what, 72 hours or something like that. Um, probably the collateral damage that hurt most was the Maker Club. Like I said, we spent after schools, weekends, summers, the kids were always in that space. And so we tried to keep a, a virtual Maker Club going and it was kind of a sad substitution for the real thing. Um, but we didn't actually do any 3D printing. We had done our 3D printing instruction in the fall, and then we're hoping to do our 3D printing instruction this May. But as far as what we were up to, 3D printing has been on hold during that time. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. I mean, I think you echo a lot of people who are kind of in that tech role who kind of had to like take over and teach everyone how to use Google Classrooms and, and all that good stuff at the transition. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Jamie, what about you? What what was that transition period like for you and your students? So uh, last year, um, I was teaching math, computer science, and engineering when schools were shut down. And in my math class, we had just finished a 3D printing project um, with um, polar flower making polar flowers on 3D printers and exploring those. So I was excited that at least we had finished that. But in my engineering class, we were just getting ready to start learning about additive manufacturing. Um, so we had no idea how long this was all gonna last. Um, I brought some 3D printers home with me, but I mean, I couldn't get prototypes to my students. So I just tried to adapt the best I could. Um, we were using Microsoft Teams, of course, so I could bring in um, outside resources so I brought some people who worked in additive manufacturing and uh, had them talk to my engineering class about additive manufacturing and how, you know, what industry is doing with additive manufacturing and the future of the field. Um, I decided that we had some time, so I would have the kids uh, do some video tutorials to learn Fusion 360 um, instead of Tinkercad to kind of kick it up a notch since Fusion 360 is, is free for um, schools. So, did that and you know it was the kids really the kids enjoyed it but at, at the same time they couldn't really get any you know get any get their hands on what they made so I did uh, do an engineering design project that was sort of you know COVID impacts design something that um, is is is, re is necessary because of the pandemic. And, um, you know, I made 3D printing an option and some students designed, uh, chose to design things to be 3D printed and some students chose to make prototypes on their own at home. But, you know, we just did the best we could, we adapted. Hearing that, uh, Jackie, what, what was the transition like for you and your students? So our lockdown in Ohio began in March. And like many others, we had no idea mm -hmm if it was going to last two weeks, like originally was stated, or the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to keep my kids kind of like on the same schedule as if we were in the classroom, just to try to provide some normalcy mm -hmm. for them. And so I did have my mm -hmm. complete 3D design lessons using Tinkercad. And then I would give them a challenge to create their own design with, with some given requirements. Um, I did not print the item, mm -hmm. but what I did do is have my students take a screenshot, and then we had Zoom mm -hmm. and that would allow the students to share their ideas with the class, and we could talk about, hey, you know, make sure mm -hmm. that, that piece is is um, holding on to that and it's thick enough, that sort of thing. Uh, I right. also took the Ultimaker Design Challenge cards, and I I turned those into the the wheel that you can spin, and so I was still able to do that project. Mm -hmm. Um, I put the, the handout in Cami so they could type in what their cards were. Uh, we were able to do that remotely. Um, and then I was able to bring one of my 3D printers home. And with the help of Matter Hackers, uh, I got involved with 
3D printing the visors for the face shields and the ear savers. And so I involved my students with that as well. And then, um, you know, I had I had some orders, you know, they wanted like 500. And so I called Mara at Matter Hackers. I'm like, hey, can you help me out here? So we got involved with that. And that was really cool because then the students could see, hey, here's, here's what we're going through in this world, but here's how we can take a leadership role and help mm -hmm. and not just sit back and do the woe is me type of thing. So it was, you know, it, it was rough, but in every situation you have to have that positive attitude going. So that's what I tried to try to keep going with my students. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fantastic. Being able to show students, it, one of the benefits of 3D design and printing is, is having that quick turnaround in that iterative process and being able to apply that to COVID and, and help in that way, I think that's really fantastic. Um, Samantha, what about you? What was your situation like? Because I, I think that yours was a little bit different. Um, yeah, it kind of, it does sound like mine, mine seems, sounds a little like drastically different. Um, so our shelter in place started on uh, March 13th. And um, my class that I teach is an elective class. And so I was very concerned with overloading my students with projects when I knew that they had, you know, big focus on their core subjects. And then another issue was, at least um, in our district, many students didn't have the access to technology right away. So we had, we faced that issue of getting technology and devices into our students' hands. Um, and then on the other side of that, students knew that they were gonna pass their classes. And so they kind of felt, I can just do the bare minimum. And that was really a trend among all of my classes, not just um, not just my elective, but in my uh, science classes and all the teachers in my district kind of faced the same issue. Um, so what I really did for the rest of the school year, oh, and I forgot to mention, I was also preparing for maternity leave at the time. So I started my maternity leave um, in the beginning of May. So I also had um, that challenge as well. Um, so <laughs> I kind of had the students focus on, you know, maybe some research, a little bit of design, but really um, my class just kind of got reworked completely um yeah it was mostly focused on on that research piece um they didn't really get to do 3d design and definitely didn't build anything so yeah i mean <laughs> thank you for sharing that i i from the teachers that i've talked to across the u.s a lot of teachers had kind of that same experience of you know, 3D design and printing is incredible, but a lot of students don't even have access to computers and Wi-Fi at home. So uh, it was definitely, I think, a challenge for many people right there at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually gonna hand it over to Mary and she's going to ask you guys some, some more hard hitting questions about 3D design and printing. Yeah, so kind of talking about like the reintroduction to bringing back 3D printing or kind of, um, your transition at the beginning, but what has it been like to reintroduce 3D design um, and printing during distance learning or even in the hybrid model, kind of being able to um, talk to like the limitations it's had or anything like that, kind of starting with you, Samantha, um, kind of talking about what you've been able to do to really reintroduce 3D design or what limitation you've really had while you've seen um, kind of meeting them virtually. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as you know, we've been completely virtual and at home. So I have not, I mean, I've been to my, my own classroom twice so far this school year. So I haven't even had access to um, my 3D printer. Um, so I've been able to reintroduce 3D design. We just haven't done that printing part yet. Um, I was very lucky and our curriculum director, we had some really great conversations and I told him, I'm not gonna be able to follow um, the Project Lead the Way curriculum the way that it's supposed to be taught. Um, and he said, okay, just do what you think is best and reconfigure it. And I've been very lucky and fortunate because I, I don't think that everyone has had has been able to do that and kind of, you know, get to almost write their own, their own program. Um, so since we are all virtual and not able to build together, I did reorganize or rewrite most of those projects. Um, 
So in this course that I teach children learn about, or my students learn about children with cerebral palsy, and we um, create solutions to problems that they might have. So I have three parts that I did this in. Um, they'd make a ankle foot orthosis, we design an inclusive playground, and then we do a therapeutic toy. And so for each project, I really decided, all right, we might not be able to print, but I can get them all the way, you know, up to that point. So we really focus on um, the engineering process, and then we'll ultimately end up using Tinkercad to design their solutions. I've ha I have their links and files saved, so hopefully maybe one day I can print it for them and give it to them. Um, so hopefully we can do that. Um, I have a student this semester who has a 3D printer at home, and so he's already like steps ahead of me in printing his designs, and so that's been really fun. So at least I have you know one student who's been able to to print his designs. Um, that has been cool. Um, I think being back in the classroom is going to be very weird, but at least maybe I can get more students engaged in printing when we can go back. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think it's definitely great that you were able to kind of either move your curriculum towards just all 3D design and still being able to teach those awesome lessons. Um, Christine, I'll turn it over to you. How were you able to kind of reintroduce after that transition or even during the semester um, back 3D printing design into your regular activities? So where I left off in my story when we were trying to like reconnect maker club via video we had just ordered a prusa mini that came in we had an sla printer um we backed on kickstarter that was coming still don't know where that machine is or went during the shutdown um so again as i said i do have a 3d printing problem but um we would do like unboxing us online and it was like you know it was okay and the kids were excited um so eventually when i did get access to the classroom in late summer uh, you know how many classroom teachers, you know, that you can take home the class pet for the weekend, like the snake or the bearded dragon? Well, my students are taking home the 3D printers. And so I've driven them to a few of their houses. And then every few weeks, um, they have the opportunity to swap. And right now, that swap option is only available to the kids in my maker club and not to the wider population, um, just for bandwidth. As many of us no, I think this summer the hardest thing was time. And there's so much time put into designing plan A, B, C, D, E, and F for school reentry that um, I had more ideas than time, certainly. Uh, we did offer summer school to our families. Again, for that sense of normalcy you brought up, like the kids missed each other, their connections had changed. And so that we had a number of 3D design courses. So our students who were entering sixth grade in the fall really used that as an opportunity to get to know some kids before they were going to join us on campus and ultimately high, um, online in the fall. And then my partner um, has a 3D printer at home as well. And he offered a course, a very expensive course, but he said to the parents, if you want to buy an Ender 3D, or I'm sorry, an Ender kit, it's about what, $280 or something. And then his summer school course was walking the kids through building that. So through that course, we have another 14 kids um, that have a 3D printer at home. So that's actually opened up a lot this fall with my maker club because I'm now up to 20 some kids that can have access at home from the summer school, a couple personal, and then from the school machines um, moving around. And um, so we're back to kind of where we were. We're at maker club. We're um, we're pretty involved in testing things out. Again, the kids, the, just the ones that had 3D printers, 3D printed objects in order to pour silicone, and then they're going to make chocolates in the shape of the thing that they 3D printed. Um, and then hopefully we're going to brainstorm. If we're not on campus by May, we're going to go ahead and do our 3D design um, lessons through sixth grade technology um, using Tinkercad. And all through the year, if kids would send us an STL, we would print it on our machines and then send it back to them in the mail. So we're trying to keep it alive. It's real high interest for the kids. So. Yeah, that's amazing to have like up to 20 kids now having like a 3d printer being accessible at home. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing and, that. Jack and because they built it, they can fix it because they uh -huh. built it from. Yeah. So that's really a benefit. That's awesome. I love that. 
Jackie, how about you? How are you able to kind of reintroduce 3D design during this time? So I was able to continue the 3D design with my students, but they had to wait until we were back in the building to get their items. Um, I used to, and I kind of laugh about it now, but I used to have the students save the STL file onto a flash drive and then I'd take it to the printer. Um, and for some reason I got smart this year and, and made a folder on the Google Drive. So that allows them to just upload the STL file. Um, and I was able to print it when I was able to go into the building and then I also have a printer at home. So I was allowed to print projects pretty much around the clock. And when you have 150 students, um, that's, that's a big benefit to be able to get that many projects done. Um, I also, like I mentioned earlier, I use the, the Ultimaker Design Challenge and I put those cards into a wheel to spin and use the cami uh, for the document. And so then I place students into groups. So when we were having our Zoom meeting, I would say like, um, Okay, Ashley, Christine, Samantha, you are in one, you are in group one. And then we would spin the wheel. They would write down their information, that sort of thing. Um, and then they would design it, send it to me, and I would print it. So, for instance, this is one. It's kind of hard to see with the sun. Their cards were design something for an artist when they are drawing things. So this holds the pencils, holds a glue stick or paper clips. Um, sticky notes, it's pretty slick. Uh, so I printed that out and then the students were able to pick those up when we returned. So kept it alive. Yeah, that's amazing. Did, were you printing out all 150 students' <laughs> projects yourself? Um, so, sometimes I do, but like for the, the, the Ultimaker Design Challenge project, you have one per group. So okay. normally I would have four to five groups per class. I teach six classes. So that reduces the time. Okay. But 150, I'd be there. I would start the printer going before I left at night. And I've got, now I've worked my way up to having more than one printer. But I start them, you know, before I leave the school at night and then they print all night. Um, and then start all over the next day. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. And then finally, Jamie, how have you been able to reintroduce 3D design? during this time? Yeah, I've had to be flexible um, because, you know, as, as everyone else has said, you know, the benefit of 3D printing is the quick turnaround and you get to design something and see it and hold it in your hands and be like, ooh, ah, shoot, I messed this up. Let me, you know, I'm mismeasured. Um, so that's really, dis that's really difficult when kids can't do that, but, but we have to kind of turn that around and, and kind of find the positive. So um, it's just a little bit just you can do the same thing. It just works more slowly. So um, I've done 3D printing in my classes. Um, you know, this year I've helped my colleagues bring 3D design. So touch isn't, you know, touch is an issue with COVID. So things that they used to work in groups on um, that now, OK, can we can we do 3D design and and look at it from that standpoint and design something and print it and then maybe put it all together at the end. So some people have embraced 3D printing who hadn't tried it before, so that's been pretty cool. Um, and I can join their classes um, via Teams. Um, and since you know they've got hybrid and in-person or remote and in-person students, I can join their classroom. I can teach them, you know, here's what additive manufacturing is about. Here's the different kinds of um, people who use it. So I try to give them an overview of, of additive manufacturing still, and you know what industries use it and what kinds of things can be made. So at least they enter into it having some background information. Um, and then, um, you know, with, when kids have design issues, I can help them. We just either have chats over Teams or video chats. I, I, we use the Polar Cloud for printing. So I show the kids how to um, upload designs to the Polar Cloud so they can submit them to me. And then if a student is remote, um, they can come to our designated pickup area and grab their 3D prints. So, I mean, it's just slower. It, it works, but it's slower. And, you know, you just have to really kind of rethink, okay, what do I want to get out of this? And what should I focus my, my time on and the student's time on? Yeah, that is amazing. You guys all have gone above and beyond for your students, especially with printing for them and being able to really see that through. Um, kind of what advice would you say that you have for educators trying to introduce 3D design and printing during distance learning? Kind of what lessons have you learned or what you would share with another educator? Jamie, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, 
So the biggest piece of advice is, you know, plan plenty of time and be flexible. So 3D printing takes time anyway. I mean, you you heard what Jackie said, you know, printing out 10 designs, even, I mean, let alone 150, that takes time. So uh, with COVID, it just takes more time. So plan plenty of time. Online design tools, like everybody's mentioned Tinkercad, they're they're so easy to use remotely. Um, helping helping students with design issues can take longer, so that you know that does require some extra time. And if you don't have access to a 3D printer, um, you can still introduce students to additive manufacturing and what it's about, and and the the different ways to approach design so that um, the objects actually utilize the benefits of additive manufacturing and 3D printing. So um, you know that's that's definitely a worthwhile use of time, even if you can't actually uh, physically print an object. Tinkercad, Tinkercad classrooms are amazing. All your students can join a classroom. You can see what they're working on. So if there's any concerns about are my students actually doing work, you can monitor that in, in Tinkercad classrooms. Students can share with each other. Um, it, it really does make things make it easy. So even if you can't print, focus on the design piece, which you know I, I think I've heard everybody here say already. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Christine, what advice would you give? I absolutely agree with Jamie about focusing on the design piece and these tools have just really opened up those opportunities to us. Um, advice wise, one thing I would say, especially when we're remote is to very early on set up a culture of you know peer teaching and encourage kids like when they get stuck, share their screen and ask for advice. Because I found out through all of this remote teaching, if I don't establish that culture quickly in my classes, it becomes camera off mute, you tell me what to do. But it's exciting when the kids are solving each other's problems. And so that kind of like screen sharing and things like that have been really um, nice. I also personally trying really hard to not talk about what used to be. Um, and so I, the advice would be to always be like, what is our reality now? What are the benefits of what we have? And what does the future hold? especially with younger kids that have never been on campus, for them to hear about the older kids talk about what it was like when we had 3D printers. Um, I think that's a deficit model. So we're trying to look forward. And then finally, um, I would say to really listen to your kids on screen time. And my maker club has transformed from being very electronics, 3D printing, VR based to like, they just want to dry felt and like make models because they're on the screen all day. And so even if they're excited about 3D printing, they don't really wanna do Tinkercad in my after school club because they're tired and their eyes hurt. And so I have to kind of pull back on my expectations and meet the kids where they are. Great reminder, thank you for sharing. Um, Jackie, what advice would you have for our listeners? First of all, I apologize. The sun is actually shining in Ohio, so it's uh, it's coming in on me, which is awesome. Um, my advice would be you have to be patient. Um, and like Jamie had said, allow some extra time and you have to be flexible, uh, especially during this time. You know, we have the wonderful opportunity to help our kids understand how to cope. And this might be a great mechanism on showing that, oh, hey, you know, it's okay. If it takes us an extra day, it's, that's cool. So I have patience. Um, you can use Tinkercad like everybody else has said. Um, I try to keep most of my 3D printing projects pretty open. So that way you're not stifling the creativity. A lot of times I'll say, you know, three inches max all the way around. So that way you can print more. I know somebody was asking me in the chat how many printers I have. Um, and I have three larger ones and two smaller ones. And that helps with the print time. Um, the other thing that I started doing was kids love to have the color. And so one of my projects was uh, they designed bobbleheads. Okay, so one girl was looking up at my windowsill and saw my, my sun catcher things wobbling. And she was like, why can't we make those? So they designed bobbleheads. And what I did is I printed it on either clear or white filament. And then thanks to Mara from Matter Hackers again, she's my go-to person. Uh, she's like, well, you can use permanent markers and they can color them in. And so um, again, during this time with COVID, it's amazing how kids just being able to color something, 
just brings down the anxiety and, and allows them to stay calm. Um, so again, I already shared, I, I have them upload their design to the Google Drive and I try my very best um, since we're in hybrid, I see them either Wednesday, Fridays or Tuesday, Thursday. So I try to get the, the groups printed. So the next day back in class, they have them. Um, so that's, they're, they're all about instant gratification. So that's also a lesson on, hey, you know what? This, this doesn't happen overnight, people. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just let, basically my, my rules are it has to be school appropriate and it cannot contain weapons, that sort of thing. And, and think before you're designing, if in doubt, like when I taught a video editing class, if in doubt, leave it out. So I share that with the 3D printing is if you're in doubt, <laughs> switch it up, man. Um, but patience, patience. Yeah, thank you for sharing and also for bringing in some examples too. I love those bobbleheads. Thanks for showing those as well. Um, and then finally, Samantha, what advice do you have for fellow educators in this space? You know, I think I'm really just about to echo what Jamie, Christine, and uh, Jackie said. Definitely be flexible and be prepared for everything to take a lot longer than it would in person. I know um, for me personally, I'm giving like three times as much time as I would as I normally give. Um, you know, students at home, at least, you know, in our case, um, students at home are dealing with a lot more distractions than they, they would at school. Um, so many of my students say, you know, they just got so much going on at home. Um, on the flip side, I do have some that actually are doing very well virtually, but um, it, I think overall, it, it, they've got a lot going on. Um, they also run into tech issues and you know and sometimes it's it's so much harder not being there to help them fix it you know we can we can of course share screen and stuff but when you're with them it's so much easier to help work through some of these issues um so even if you can't print designs like it is in my case having students build their designs using um, recycled materials which i think i forgot to mention that earlier i i do have kids doing that building um using recycled materials at home and i think that that's even a great alternative um i've gotten you know it gets kids away from their computer and i know christine mentioned screen time um so it gets them away from the computer and actually doing something with their hands um, even like Jackie said, with the coloring, they just like to do something different. Um, and I've gotten a ton of positive feedback from students on doing those activities. So even though they can't print, they can still make something from what they designed. And um, I think that's a pretty a, a good compromise for now. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. I definitely think like our biggest theme for like advice was being patient, flexible, allowing more time to complete projects. So definitely thank you for sharing all of that with our educators. Um, and I have just like one more question for each of our panelists, but I also wanna let anyone know that is in the audience, if you want to ask our panelists any questions, feel free to hop over to the Q&A and drop one there as well um, and upvote your favorite question. So if you have a very similar question to one that's already in the chat, make sure that you upvote it so we can do that right after this question. But I'm gonna kind of turn it over to our final question, which is, um, basically, what is your vision for hands-on learning um, post-COVID? Um, we're probably going to be with like a little bit of virtual hybrid learning for a while now, um, but kind of what would your vision be for that? Um, and I'm going to start with Jackie. Um, what do you think that your vision is for this? Well, I think and this is this is not even related to 3D printing, but I think that COVID has taught all of us um, that there's there's a lot to appreciate in life. Um, and I think it has taught us that we all need to learn how to manage stress a little bit better. So I want to continue to challenge my students to become better leaders, to be innovative, uh, to use their resources instead of being spoon fed. And I think that has really started to kick in since we've been remote learning. And I want that to carry over to post COVID when we're all back in the classroom. Sometimes students will get upset with me because I'll say, well, hey, refer to your handout. And I'm like, well, why don't you just show me? No, I'm not gonna spoon feed you. Um, so post COVID, it will also mean some great things that I'll be able to bring back some of my group projects like the, 
3D printed battery car. Um, so students will be able to be working together again. Um, but like I said, I think my biggest thing is um, we are at, we are in a position where we can use our class to help make sure that our students are okay. And I think we need to really be aware of that because your core, some of your core classes, um, and I know, Jamie, I believe you're a science teacher, so it's harder for the, the core classes, um, but let's make sure they're okay. And if 3D printing allows them that downtime, then let's use more 3D printing to allow them to expand and just chill out. So I call my classroom the island because I don't want them to be stressed out. So that's my goal. I love that. Thanks, Jackie. Christine, what is your vision for hands-on learning post-COVID? I'm very excited to have our community back. I do feel weirdly fortunate that this pandemic is happening now and not 25 years ago because video is a pretty good proxy for being together. Um, but it doesn't take the place of like the multi-age hands-on peer teaching that was happening in our programs. And again, the curriculum goals are important and I'm excited for kids to learn Tinkercad and to learn about additive manufacturing and tech and all those kind of things. But where I think they get the most value is out at a maker fair showing, you know, an elderly man and his young granddaughter, how this new technology works. Or um, we do family maker Fridays where, um, you know, we have kids as young as four in the room with grandparents and my kids are the experts. Like they're the ones teaching everybody. And probably most excited, um, I have a lot of high school alumni that come back to our middle school maker club. Like why, who when they're 16 wants to come and hang out with 11 year olds, but that's their space and that's where they belong. And so even now, you know, my, a few of my high school kids ask, could they be TAs for virtual maker space or maker club? And I'm like, well, there's not really anything to do, but they show up every week and they take that leadership because that's their path of belonging. And, um, you know, last night watching, we had our virtual Family Maker Friday and to watch a seventh grader take a group of, you know, prospective families to our school. And he was teaching them Tinkercad because that's a big draw for our school. And, you know, the kids are the leaders. And so I'm excited them to get back out and share what they've learned. And then also to have that space to always come home. That's awesome that they're able to act as mentors during this time too, to prospective students. Thank you for sharing that, Samantha, or Christine. Samantha, I'll turn it over to you next. What would you say that your um, COVID hands-on learning looks like? So I think that one of the things that I've really missed the most with our virtual format is the collaboration between students. Um, almost everything, the kids are working on projects by themselves. And so I think that post-COVID, I never want to take collaboration for granted. Um, so I kind of have a vision of, you know, everything those kids are, they're going to be working together whether they like it or not. <laughs> um, that's just, I think that that's really important. Um, and then Jackie said something that made me kind of think a little bit. Um, she's mentioned about not spoon feeding kids, um, the directions or the answers or anything. And, I think that being online and at home, the students, they've had to work through their problems by themselves, essentially. And I'm not there to help them. I'm not there to really, I mean, I, we're there on the computer, but I'm not there to really do too much with them. And so I am envisioning when we're back and it's post COVID, um, the kids, they're going to be working together and I'm not going to help them. <laughs> so um, I called it independent collaborators is um, my vision for post COVID. <laughs> I like that a lot. And then finally, Jamie, what is your vision for hands on learning post COVID? So um, I, uh, I like to look at the future of work and future of jobs report that kind of come out year after year. And a couple years ago, I um, was looking at a future of work report that came out of Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, it pointed out the need to um, that schools to share what the future looks like with the kids. And, and I try to do that with my students. And um, the World Economic Forum just recently, I think it was in November, released a future of jobs report. 
And they found the pandemic has accelerated companies' efforts to scale things like remote work, digitalization, and automation, um, which makes sense, right? Um, but the report also continued to explain, as other reports that I've seen, um, that companies are looking for employees who are innovators, who are creative, who are resilient, analytical thinkers, active learners. And I mean, what better way to teach kids those skills than with hands-on learning? Um, making activities, 3D printing activities. I mean, that stuff is critical to, to helping students develop these future of job skills and not just developing them, but telling them why. I mean, you're, you're doing this so that you're ready for the future as well. I mean, um, you know, it, it's helpful to explain that to them. And, and you know, these, these skills like creative thinking and resilience and taking risks and embracing failure. I mean, kids really need to, um, to have exposure and to, to experience all of those and school is a safe environment for that so you know post covid let's let's get back on and let's let's keep going and um help prepare kids for their future awesome thank you so much jamie um and i'm going to hand it over to ashley to ask some questions from our audience right now from the q a section so again feel free if you haven't asked your question yet to throw it on in there yeah yeah so we are schedule, but we will extend the panel for just a, a couple more minutes and do some Q&As. And then we can go into the networking breakout rooms. And if you have questions for specific teachers, you can just pop into their room and start chatting with them. Um, but so our first question here is, which teachers are public, charter, or private schools? So I'll start off with Christine. Uh, my school is a private school in Berkeley. And but I will say that I was a public school teacher for a long time and I'm not a different teacher in public school than I am in private school. And the first nine 3D printers that I purchased was out of pocket. Um, in 2016, our school did um, remodel and build a maker lab um, and five teachers share it. It's filled all day with science and tech classes. Um, so the open making space is lunch, recess and after school clubs. Um, so, you know, 2016, my school really put some money behind making, but prior to that, it was, you know, me and the kids, again, the kids convincing me to spend my own money because they're very good at it. Um, but I'm fortunate my school is very supportive at this point. Great, thank you. Okay, Jackie, are you public, private, or charter? Um, I in a, I'm in a private school, but I'm also um, career tech ed certified. So that helps. So anybody out there that is career tech certified, um, I know at least in Ohio, you do get some money from the state and that would help you out as well. Uh, Jamie, what about you? Uh, I teach in an independent school. So it's, um, like I said, 18 months through 18 years um, independent school. All right, and Samantha? Uh, we're a public school district. Great, great. Um, okay, so the, my next question in the chat here is how did remote learning affect funding or support for maker clubs or labs? Um, I'm gonna start with Christine and we'll make our way through the group. So like there wasn't any funding per se for our maker program. A lot of it was in our science classes and because we are remote, um, our funds are really needed for other things right now. So we're not putting that money into like supplies for the kids or machines. Um, outside of that, our kids do pay for after school clubs and I consider it my startup. So if I break out even at the end of my club, I, I consider it a good year. Um, if I lose money, I consider it education. And if I make money, I consider it a win. Um, and that part has changed because it isn't as fun for me to buy machines and headsets and things if the kids aren't gonna be able to use them. So we're not putting much money into 3D printing at all in the last year. And my money is going more into, like I said, the maker club kits and the things we drive around and drop off at their houses. And that often does not involve 3D printing. Uh, Jackie, what about you? So ours, like I had stated just a minute ago, um, I do get career tech ed money from the state. And so, the money hasn't really changed a whole lot for us. Um, we are in the process of moving my lab down so that I'm next to the industrial arts teacher so we can collaborate more. 
or as Samantha said, uh, what was that, independent collaboration. Um, but yeah, and then I use, we have a $10 student fee that, that we charge each student. And so that helps take care of things as well. Uh, Jamie, I'll pose the question to you now. Um, we are fortunate to have a, um, one of our alumni who um, really um, has supported our making efforts and started a design and innovation fund at our school. So um, the equipment in our makerspace, which includes 3D printers, um, comes from that fund. All right, and last but not least, Samantha, has your funding changed at all? Uh, so the school uh, district did get like COVID money. Um, and a lot of that went to filling the tech needs of our students. So for me specifically, having the kids have, it, have devices definitely helped out. But in terms of things that I needed for my class, not really just because I, I wasn't printing at all. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, so our next question in here is, um, were there specific design softwares that were better than others to use during the remote setting? Um, and I'll just pose that to the group and whoever wants to answer first, uh, feel free to jump in. Always be on team Tinkercad. It's a very low floor, high ceiling. Jamie brought up the classroom feature, which allows you to tweak their designs before you 3D print them without having to ask them their passwords to go in and change their floating block. Um, and it works on Chromebooks. Like until we had a program that worked on Chromebooks, 3D design was not gonna be at our school. Gotcha, gotcha. Does anyone, does anyone else have any other uh, softwares that they recommend? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll um, the other nice thing about Tinkercad is you can do Arduino design in Tinkercad. You can, there's so many different aspects of Tinkercad that are wonderful and free. Um, I've used, like I mentioned, Fusion 360. Um, and I, uh, my school has a license to Mathematica software, which um, I used in my math classes to, uh, the kids could explore math and then very easily export those designs for laser cutting for 3D printing to turn the math into math art as well. Jackie or Samantha, do you have anything else to add about uh, specific softwares? I don't have anything different. I also use Tinkercad and love it for the same reasons. <laughs> same here. I, I'm, to be honest, I've only used Tinkercad, so have not ventured out. <laughs> so this is a kind of similar question, but are there some ways 3D printer companies or design software companies has, have helped with remote learning? Like, I, I think this question, I don't know who asked it. I hope this is what you're getting at. Um, but specific ways in which those companies have really tried to help um, through re remote learning. I will, I will say that um, Matter Hackers, they have been a tremendous help with remote learning, um, you know, I, I would call and ask for ideas with that. Um, like I said, with the, the visors for the face shields and the ear savers, um, and they, they're starting to get some curriculum for the remote learning type of thing. Um, so they were, they were a big help. And I also, I called them in the spring and said, hey, I don't have much of my own money but I want to get a 3D printer at home. And they were so helpful that, you know, you don't need this $2,500 printer to do what I wanted to do at home, so. Great, thanks for sharing that. Um, Christine, did you want to jump in as well? I would just say, I think at my school and many schools, our priorities have been really different this year. And what I thought was really important ended up not being very important when it drilled down to like the basics. And I think the community has been fairly supportive of education communities all throughout because, you know, of the 3D printers I've had, you know, a handful of them have been free from companies that are like, oh, your kids are presenting here. You can have a free printer because we would like our printer in front of your kids. Um, and, you know, Autodesk with continuing to, first of all, pick up Tinkercad when it used to be whatever that cloud program was in the original owners. So for Autodesk to pick it up and continue to develop it with the auto or the Arduino and things like that. 
So I appreciate the support throughout. I think any support I'm not seeing right now is not so much from the 3D printing community as schools just can't really put their focus there right now. Our focus is getting our kids back. Yeah, I think that that's very understandable, I think, uh, from school's point of, point of view. Um, I kind of want, so this next question relates to the Chromebook, which Christine, you were saying that your school wouldn't pick up um, a 3D design software until it could be made available on Chromebooks. Have you noticed um, if it works the same on Chromebooks uh, compared to non-Chromebooks? Personally, don't see a difference. Although the better machine you have and the better network you have, the faster things go. Did anybody else see a difference of kids that are using it at home versus Chromebooks? We use Chromebooks. We have five through 12 grades have a Chromebook and I don't see a difference at all. Well, I think that's good to know and, and something good to pass on to other teachers in the area. Um, I think right now we might be at the point where we need to wrap up um, our, our Q&As um, and, and kind of move into networking. So Janet, might you be able to help us get back into the networking uh, where we go and break out into the tables? We do that. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the first educator event in collaboration between Women in 3D Printing and Acorn. We're super excited to have educators like yourself sharing your insights and also helping um, other folks learn more about what they can do better. And through this exchange, I think we've all gotten a lot from it. So thank you very much. And we hope to continue organizing um, more educator events so that we could bring out these stories so that we can all support each other. Uh, not only through the pan pandemic, but even past that. Hopefully that'll be sooner than later. So before we jump off into the virtual networking component, just to note, there is uh, various tables across the entire virtual floor, uh, and there are names under each, under some tables. So if there's a table that you'd like to go to, just double click in the table, turn on your camera and mic, and you're all set. Any last uh, words that you want to share, Ashley, on behalf of ACORN? Um, no, thank you all so much for, for being part of this panel. I think it was so nice to hear about your guys' experience and, and also because the four of you have such different experiences with how COVID has gone um, and it's just been a really great conversation. Um, so thank you again. We, we look forward to seeing you all and your work in the future. Thank you.